So if you do go through this process of setting up Bing, let me show you what it would look like. So if you did set it up, you would get probably a basic looking screen with your site. Mine's not verified, of course, but if I had the site fully verified, I'd have some data here. Let me log into my real account where it does have some data for me to show you to explain what we did. And it's better to, to show something real than try to talk about it in theory. So let me just log in. Mm -hmm. It shut what down? You might have kicked the computer on the side here, because on the side here there's the button right next to your leg maybe, and then uh, you might have turned it off. So let me show here then the, uh, the data that comes from this can be pretty detailed and the sooner you set this up the better because this will tell you data starting from the moment you set it up going forward it won't give you data from the past so I, as I said before, I teach this stuff and I work with a company where we do this for clients. And so in my account here, I have various clients that I can look at their data. And I can manage multiple ones of them and I can have other people manage the data as well. But the thing about this screen, this is our general screen to get general data. We can get detailed data, of course. But this is showing that I'm looking at my data in 30-day increments from the last 30 days. And this particular client, there's these different uh, columns. Messages, there's no messages. Bing hasn't found anything weird, so there's no messages. If something is wrong with the site, it'll tell me. Then I've got these other four columns. Clicks from search appeared in search. Appeared in search means that someone searched for something on Bing and this client appeared on the search results. Where and how, I can see the detail in a little bit. But in general, this client in the last 30 days appeared 24% less times on a Bing search. Doesn't sound so good, but if you couple it with actual clicks, that's very good. People saw the site on Bing a few less times than the previous 30 days, but they clicked on the client more times, 133 more times than the previous time. So you won't always see positive numbers, and it's not always bad that you see negative numbers, if you think about it in context. Okay, people saw it less times, but they clicked on it more times. That's good. Uh, I could get uh, appeared more in search. Maybe I got 130 more views appeared on search, but then I got negative 1% clicks. So people are seeing me more but not clicking me. So that's a positive and a negative, and that could be a net negative. Here's a, here's a positive and a negative, and it's a net positive. This one might have more of the importance, actual clicks going to my website. Not that they just saw me on a Bing search or Google search, they actually clicked and followed through. Now, they both might be negative numbers, sure. But that is still, think about it in terms of, this was the last 30 days. If I change that to the last three months, six months, one year, two years, and then if I see a trend in six months of negative numbers, that might be bad, pretty bad. But one month might not be so bad. We can look at it in seven days. Seven days, you know, it appeared less times and it was neutral, same amount of clicks. This, I think about it as, as the stock market. If you know, if you pay attention to the stock market, you know that 2016 is so far starting off to a terrible year in the stock market. But this year is 13 days old. We'll look back 300 days later, how did the stock market do? We'll come back 600 days later, how did the stock market do? Because the stock market also is something in the long term. Um, so in the long term, if my investments have done bad, okay, 
that was a bad investment. But in one year, if I don't quite know if that was a bad investment. In five years, I might know better. In ten years, the stock market is a long game. So is, the, so, so is this data here. Seven days, it's irrelevant, unless you really want to see what you did in one week. Thirty days is okay, but the longer you have this set up and the more data you can see, the, more, the better trends you get and the more understanding you get. Past six months, past three months, in the past three months, notice that. More appearance in search and more clicks compared to the previous months. So in the longer time periods, you want to go through more greens. Uh, but in the shorter time periods, they might not be as relevant unless you're checking. I tweeted a lot this month. Did it work? I tweeted a lot this week. Did it work? The next columns are pages crawled and pages indexed. Bing and Google will send little automated robots, little spiders, to crawl your website to check everything on your website, to follow every link on your website. Pages crawled. If you've been blogging and adding new content, the search engines will see more content. They crawled more content. They found more content. So pages crawled. It could be positive or negative. If it's positive, you added more to your website and the search engines found it. If it's negative, you didn't add anything to your website, so zero or negative numbers compared to the last month. Perhaps the more important of these two columns is the pages index. Indexed is that Bing or Google actually found something on your website and saved it to the index, the big database of all of the info that the, that the search engines know that they have. So this particular client, the search engines didn't find anything new. That is, it didn't find anything new to add to the index. In that particular client, it's true. Nothing was really added to the site, so nothing was new for the search engines. As I'm a blogger and I'm going to be blogging, this number would increase. And I want that. I want the search engines to find more about me so that when someone searches these concepts, I can get found. These columns here are just in general. See, it looks really terrible here. Negative 65% clicks in the last 30 days. But as I stretch out the time horizon, uh, it's a bit of a wash there. Longer times. Some of these have been, been set up for longer times. But um, I can go into more detail. Let's say I click on a particular client to f see more detail. Here's what I will see the actual numbers. 65% less clicks from a month ago, which was this month. So far has been 8 clicks. Last month was 23. This month, this client has appeared 391 times on a Bing search. Last month, 405 times. So you can get the raw numbers, the exact numbers. Crawl errors and pages indexed. There have been less errors on the site. Things have been fixed, broken links and such, because broken links are detrimental to your SEO. If you've got broken links on your site, the search engines will penalize you for that. The search engines want a good site with no links, not only internal, but external. If you've got a link from your website to someone else's website, and their website goes down, that could hurt you because you're linking to some non-existent page and the search engines don't like that. So this tool will tell us what are the broken links. So here at least it's telling us that some of these links have been fixed. Good. Less broken links. Less crawl errors. And then these are the pages this month that were found compared to last month. Changes to the site. Again, blogging and such. If you're not updating your site, it might not help you as much. And updating the site does not mean changing your logo, adding a new welcome text to the home page. It means adding new content, usually blog posts, blogging about something of once a month, once a week, once a day, if you're able to. Then it mentions a sitemap. We added a sitemap. 
We checked it, it works out. The cool thing is that once we add a new blog post, the sitemap will update itself and tell Bing or Google there's something new. So that's another importance of the sitemap. It lists everything on your site and it alerts the search engines to something new. As I said, I wouldn't code this document myself because it is it is code, it is XML code that I wouldn't bother trying to write myself and I've had 15 years experience in this stuff. I wouldn't sit down and try to write this kind of document. It's technically not complicated, but it's very time-consuming, and if you do it wrong, it's going to hurt you. you know, something like this. You have to write the address and when it was last modified in this specific format, Greenwich Mean Time, and this other tag, and this and this and that. I don't bother with that. It's complicated. My handout mentions, if you go to sitemaps.org, you can get information on creating them. But really, the short answer is, if you've got WordPress especially, there's a plugin, WordPress SEO by Yoast. That company pulls out a free plugin that helps you create a sitemap and other cool SEO things. Other platforms like Wix and Weebly and Squarespace, they have a version of it. And once I've got a sitemap here on Bing or Google, I submit my sitemap, and then it will help the search engine, it will keep the search engine happy, a happy search engine could be more traffic to your website. This is a very useful screen here, keyword search. I can see all. What this screen is about, these are the keywords that people are typing on Bing or Yahoo, and how that relates to your site. People are typing the name of the client, it's appearing on average on page, I mean on, on position 6.5 or so. People are searching these keywords, interestingly enough, best soul food in Chula Vista, even though this is an Italian food restaurant. I guess Italians have souls also. But uh, best soul food Italian uh, Chula Vista, it appeared on this on the rankings, some of these had resulted in actual clicks, some were just views, some were clicks. But this screen serves also a purpose to help me with my keyword strategy. Last week we talked about the basic keyword strategy and the much newer and better long tail keyword strategy. A strategy that is detailed keywords. It found here someone searched your planning and intimate affair that could be a keyword that I use on my site or on Twitter or whatever because it's gotten some views. So those keywords are words that um, consumers are clicking. Mm -hmm. And notice next to each one of these there's a dollar symbol. I talked on day one that you can pay for keywords, you can pay for placement, you can pay for traffic. And this is right here, front and center. If you would like for the keyword of Chula Vista restaurants, when someone types Chula Vista restaurants, my restaurant could appear higher than the competition. If I pay, on average, 14 cents per click on the main line, or 11 on the sidebar. What that means is I put in a pool of money, $100, let's say, those $100 that they give me for free, and I pay $100, and I buy that keyword, and when someone searches that keyword and clicks on that link to go to my site, 14 cents is sub subtracted from my $100. If my, if my position is in the main part of search, only 11 cents it's if, in, if it's in the sidebar. Little by little, it's chipping away. But now, this says average bid, because at the moment, who's ever been paying for this keyword has been paying that much. I could say, let me buy that for 25 cents. So then I'm going to take it away from my competitors, and now it will help me more than my competitors. 
then they might log in and see the console and see I'm not getting as much traffic. Oops, someone else bought this for 25 cents. Let me pay for it a dollar per click. So then now my competitor is going to be higher than me, and it's an arms race, like I said last time. Uh, people pay and outbid you, and now they the traffic goes to them. Bing does this, Google does this, Facebook does this to a degree. All of these sites do this. Pay for placement, pay for clicks. PPC, pay per click. We're not going to talk about that in this class. We're talking about the free stuff. But here's how you can look at this. You can purchase this, and it's not so bad to do this once in a while. You have a $10 budget, a $100 budget once a year, let's say. You can engage in this a bit to get you some traffic, especially if you're starting from zero. But you do the PPC and you do the organic, which is what this is class is all about, and together then that could be a very good combination. Would they write A, B, and next to it? Yes, they, they would. There would be a little ad marker next to it. And so, okay, I don't want to pay, but this screen is still very useful to help me figure out these keywords. I don't have to pay just to see this. I could see these keywords and then, okay, great, I'm going to start using... Uh, People apparently were typing Carpaccio, spelled correctly and spelled incorrectly. So I could perhaps tweet about Carpaccio because people are searching that. Chula Vista Carpaccio. Like like yeah, because there could be the, the, the real spelling of something and it costs a dollar per click, but there could be a slight misspelling and it's only 25 cents. People might misspell it, especially the complex word like Carpaccio. So I could buy the misspelled word, and that could get me some traffic if the real spelling is too expensive. Or I could buy both and get traffic from both. And so, even if I don't pay for any of this, this could give me ideas about what to... Um, what to do for keywords. This one is a bit of a gray hat technique. Remember last week I talked about white hat techniques, black hat te techniques, and gray hat techniques. White hat techniques are the positive official techniques that you do for SEO. Black hat techniques are what the spammers do. The destructive techniques are the techniques that used to work but now don't work anymore. And gray hat is somewhere in the middle. This is a gray hat technique here, I would say. Look at the keywords, and some of these keywords are going to be specifically about your competition, uh, like Filippi's Italian Restaurant. I could buy that keyword, and people might be searching for Filippi's, and they'll see my result higher than them. Um, that's a way to go. Also, I would call that gray hat. It's not. It's not bad. It's. It's. You know, perhaps a little underhanded, but it's not bad. They don't prevent you from doing that. They'll gladly sell you that keyword. It's not white, really, because, you know, I'm not really working with my stuff. I'm kind of subverting the competition's keywords. So it's kind of in the middle. It's a possible way. I don't really do it with my clients, um, but it's doable. You can look at your competition's keywords here and buy them. They might be doing it with you. Now at a certain point it's diminishing returns. Way at the bottom only one person searched for you know Sopranos on 3rd Avenue. At a certain point you can also, ca you can also um, organize this like that click-through rate is a column to pay attention to. That is, there's a keyword. What was the rate that people actually clicked it? 50% rate using that misspelling and on. I won't go through these other screens just yet because if you did manage to set up your Bing Webmaster Tools, you probably don't have any data to, to show for it yet. This is going to could, this is going to accumulate data 
as time goes on. So you um, you want to set it up as soon as you can, and then as time goes on, this will accumulate data, and then you can work with it. When we come back next time, we'll look much more in detail about um, these webmaster tools. So I'm going to shift gears over to do this now for Google. If you were able to do it for Bing, good. Now we'll do it for Google. If you weren't able to do it for Bing, we'll go for Google. And you can come back to Bing and see if you can do it. What I will do now is you can open a new window or a new web browser. And this time we'll go to the address google.com slash webmasters. Let's go to google.com slash webmasters. They changed the name of this recently, sometime last year. Now they call it Search Console. Those of us that have been using it for a decade, we still keep calling it Webmaster Tools. That was the old name of it. Now it's Search Console. So I, I apologize. Also on my handout, I've still got it listed as Webmaster Tools. The new name of this thing is Search Console, even though the address is still Webmasters. So here again, we're going to either sign in or sign up. We're going to sign in. If you've got a Gmail address, sign in with Gmail. If you don't have Gmail, you can create an account. So click Sign In. Either then create an account or sign in. Uh, Google is a little bit, I would say, more stingy here. Over on Bing, if I already had a Cox email address, I could use that to create an, a Bing account. Google wants you to create a Gmail account to access any of this, even if you've got Cox or whatever. So if you do create an account, it will ask you to create a Gmail. But here then anyway, take a moment. I'll give you one or two minutes. Make sure you either log in or create an account. And then I'll show you what to do on the next screen. So is anyone having any trouble signing in or signing up? Once you get to that screen, just wait for a So you do have that domain name. Which of the two methods did you try? Option A or option B? That's what I need to verify. It doesn't want to be done. It's a two methods. You can see if I can do option one or two. So are you able to edit the website?
Let me tell you the concept that's related to why you might think of one or two of these. Once you're able to connect, you're going to transfer the file to the server, and then you're going to activate the new browser. Then you're going to see that file. The first year, obviously. All right, did everyone manage to sign in? Now, mine um, is going to look different than yours because I've set this up before. But I, if you don't see a screen exactly like mine, don't worry. But I see a screen where it lists the different websites that I manage. Again, I manage different websites. Um, it's going to show all the websites and such. One thing that is different in Google Search Console, Google Webmaster, than Bing is that Google actually considers your website to be different websites when you've got www and non-www. Google sees that as two different websites. They're technically two domains. So on Google, we will have to verify both versions of the site, the www version and the non-www version. Bing doesn't care. So it, it's the same site. Google, for some reason, shows both. Because some people visit your site by typing www.mysite.com. And some people visit you typing mysite.com. So um, we'll have to set them both up. That's how mine looks like. I've got a bunch of clients set up. You probably saw a screen right away. Add your site. And you're probably at a screen then. Add property. And I need to add my site. And you're probably at a screen that looks something like this. Search Console Verify. This is just like Bing in that we have to verify it. And we've got a few different methods. Depending, for some reason, on different people's sites, these things might be a little different looking. Mine says Recommended Method, Recommended HTML File Upload. Some of you say Recommended Method, use GoDaddy. Whatever your method is, we're going to do it like we did with Bing. For most of you, if I helped you, we either uploaded a file or added some code. This is the version in my case. Download this HTML file. It has my unique HTML identifier. I, I download it, I upload it to FTP, and I verify. If I can't do that, the other methods are, other, uh, are under alternate methods. And here we've got HTML tag. So if I showed you to verify this via the Bing method of, of the HTML tag, here's the Google version. Mine put it under alternate methods. Some of you see it on recommended. So I'm going to copy that line of code and paste it to the exact same place where I showed you, if I showed you, on your site. You will return then to Search Console and click Verify, and then that'll take you back to... That'll take you back to look at the details of your site, something like this. Let's take a moment then. Again, hopefully we can get this to work. Call me over, and we'll see if we can get it to work. And if you're able to do this, try it. And if not, we'll just, we'll just have to wait. Let's see if you can verify your site. It's going to Method, I think you're still going to be stuck perhaps because you have 
going to need to edit your index.html file, and then copy the code and edit your index.html and upload it. So you're still going to need to connect to your server to do that. That's not a good thing. So maybe not on a network thing here for some reason is preventing you from connecting. So at home, the way you usually connect, try to do the same steps here. Well, that one I would, I would ignore that one also. Don't worry about the timing of that one. But Lewis is going to do both here. Either an HTML upload or an HTML tag. That one would be the method if you're going to edit the index file. And the upload is you would just upload the file directly to the file zip. Okay, so let's say you got this set up. If you didn't, that's okay. Uh, but if you've got it set up, again, it'll start to gather data the longer you have it set up. And I won't go into all the data just yet. We'll do that next week once we've got it set up. But you, if you do get to the screen, you'll probably see something like this, these three columns of general info. Uh, one of the reasons to set up Search Console is this right here. It's going to check your site for errors. Google Analytics doesn't tell you this info. So Google, for some reason, has these different services that are that I would think go together. They're, they're separate. Google Search Console is for some of the data. Google Analytics is for other parts of the data. It's separate. Bing has it all together in one. I don't know if Google will ever merge them. Probably not. But that's why we need Google Webmaster Tools, also now known as Search Console, and Analytics. Here, if I get any problems with broken links and such, it will tell me. This particular one has 32 broken links. Well, what does that mean? I can click on that. It'll tell me directly. These are the pages we can't find. Now, broken links are detrimental to your site, as I said, but that's one of the many factors, or how Google calls them, signals. It's one of the many signals that Google looks at to rank you on the search engines. Not Files not found is one thing that could hurt you, but it many other things also could help or hurt. With this particular client, notice in this month-long time there were these amounts of broken links and they were decreased and they're going up again. The reason for this is this particular client is a restaurant and there are various events such as the Christmas event. Christmas is over. So now when Google looks for the Christmas page it's not there anymore because Christmas is no longer here. So what you can do on this page if something like this exists where it doesn't exist on purpose, I can go in, select the Christmas event, and at the top tell it it's been fixed. So then Google will process it, and then I'll have less broken links. Some of these other things might be a real broken link that, whoops, my tapioca page, my tacopia page, actually is broken. So I go to my website, I fix the link, I come back here, and I tell it it's fixed. So you would do this once a month. You would log into these webmaster tools, Bing or Google, once a month. You would log in and check these things. Um, because you don't know what's going on, perhaps. Your, 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 uh, your WordPress perhaps is not telling you everything. This is going to tell you everything. And so depending on your site, these broken links might be a lot, might be a little, might be zero. You have to check them. And if you've got a lot of them, I would recommend you deal with as many of them as possible. And again, not every link um, you have under your control. This could be a link from your site over to someone else's site. So you're going to have to, from your site, remove the link so it no longer points to the broken link. Click fixed, and it's fixed. Once you click it, it's going to remove the link. That's right. It's going to what? I just make sure that's that. When you click it, it's going to remove the link or the broken link, correct? Yes, it's going to remove it in Google. 
Google will no longer think it's a broken link because you told it. Now you could technically select them all and click fixed, but if you didn't really fix it, it's going to check and it's still going to say broken. So you do want to fix it and then confirm fixed. This tells me any broken links on a desktop web browser or laptop and any broken links on a smartphone. One broken link. That event again that passed is fixed. So under smartphone, because more traffic is coming through here, these little smartphones in our pockets, the more traffic is coming through these. Uh, so that's why we focused much more at the moment to fix these one, these broken links that Google sees from the smartphone because more traffic is coming from mobile devices now. And we've got the smartphones, which are these advanced ones with the touchpad and such, and then there's the other ones, the ones that don't have the advanced features of these. This is a smartphone. What's that other kind of phone called? What's that? Flip phone? Sure. I would call it a dumb phone, but Google calls it, or the industry calls it, a feature phone even though those things have no features. They call it a feature phone. So those older kinds of phones, flip phones and such, they're feature phones, and Google sees, Google tested and saw that there's two broken links when they tested through here. Again, these are events that, are, that have come and gone. So they've been fixed. They don't exist on purpose. So you might be surprised to find out you've got 300 broken links. Well, now you know which ones they are. You're going to fix them. You're going to tell Google they're fixed, and that's going to help your SEO ranking. If I go back to dashboard, there's other data here. Again, we won't look at it all in detail very briefly here, then we'll move on. Um, search analytics. In this time period of 30 days, from Google, we got 3,000 clicks. From this same time period, oh, let me compare the same client. So this is the Texcoco client. Um, over at Bing, in the same amount of time, 200 clicks. So 3,000 clicks from Google, 200 clicks from Bing. Obviously, because as I said, Google is 60% market share, Bing is 20%. But 200 clicks is still good. That's still traffic coming from people on Bing. I still want to sell products to them. I don't want to discount them. So I may want to make sure I'm optimized on Bing as well. And then on the sitemap, it saw 135 links in this client. There's five warnings I might want to look at. It's uh, these number of web pages and these number of images. You might think, well, why does it say submitted and indexed? Submitted is simply that Google or Bing is aware of these links. It didn't save the link in the index because it could be duplicate content. It could be that that picture is used more than once, therefore why would it save it again? It could be that that link is used more than once. Or worse, it could be that your blog post looks the same like someone else's blog post. Duplicate content, therefore it will not save it attached to your site. So when someone searches how to use Peach and someone else wrote that, you just copied and pasted it to your site, you don't get the credit here, you don't get the traffic. So duplicate content is not good. People always ask, can I borrow someone else's tweet? Can I borrow someone else's video or article or whatever? Yes and no. I highly recommend, no, don't borrow it, write your own version of it. Make your own version of that video, that blog post, that tweet, because then it's original content that the search engines will see and index. The part about maybe yes is you maybe once in a while you will share someone else's content, but again, why would you share someone else's content and give them positive SEO results? Make your own content and get all of that traffic for yourself. Next time we'll look more into Google Search Console. The last thing we'll look at is Google Analytics. But before that, any questions on Webmaster Tools here, now known as Search Console?
Up on the address bar then, we have one more thing to set up, very similar to these previous two. Now we'll go to google.com slash analytics. A-N-A-L-Y-T-I-C-S. You're probably going to spend much more time on Google Analytics than Google Webmaster Tools, Google Search Console. You might visit Google Search Console once a month, but you might visit Analytics every two weeks or so, because this will give you much more data that could be very useful for you. So let's go to that address. Google recently, at some point last year, created Google Analytics Premium. On the top right corner, you have that sign in button, and it's either sign in for the free Google Analytics or the premium. I have not used premium. I haven't quite read up on it. I don't know what the benefits are. But probably because you pay a little extra, you get better results, like everything. Google Tag Manager is Google's version of what we saw on Bing, where we saw these keywords and how much do they cost to buy them. Again, Google separates these into so many different screens and such, it's easy to get lost. Bing put it all together. And Adometry, I don't know what that is. I haven't researched it. I don't know what it is. It's probably something good. I don't know. I haven't looked at it yet. So there's always something new to learn. We're going to use Google Analytics, the first one. At the top right corner, click Sign In, Google Analytics. Sign in to Google Analytics. Again, log in with that information that you used for Search Console. It's the same Gmail and such. This is where my screen will look different as yours again, but let me confirm how that looks in just a moment. Go ahead and sign in. Let me see how your screen looks and then let's proceed. Some of you might see different things. Okay, if you see a screen with three big icons, just click sign up. I have to install this ad from a company on their old website, which is no longer around. Um, so it's actually linked to my my Google account. Yeah. And do you no longer want that? Yeah, no. It's tied it's tied to them. Our company actually just switched um thanks. Um login with the other one. Yeah, because you're saying you're not using that. I know I'm using my email. I'm just I don't. There's no use for Google, oh, these okay. analytics um, on that site. That's a. Thank you. 
All right, so here's, uh, the, here's one of the many confusing things about Google Analytics. If you're on the screen that says you're on the screen that's that looks like this it asks for account name and property let me explain what that is as I said I deal with a lot of clients I've got the different clients in different folders these folders Google calls them accounts even though you might think well I have an account why is it still asking for another account Google calls these folders accounts so when it's asking you here for what account, you, new account name, think about it in those terms. What's the name of the folder that I'm creating to save my website? Because the website is under property. And notice, with these clients, we can track more than one website with them. Let's say this client down here, vmcinc.net, is the account folder. And we're tracking the main website this YouTube channel, that YouTube channel, etc. We can track different websites, different properties, and they're tied to the same account. You can have, I believe, a hundred per folder. So you can track a lot of websites. So that's what this is saying. Probably here you're going to type the name of your website, not the address, just the name. Let's say Farmer Victor's Farm. That's the name of my website company. The actual website address will be listed here and I can track the main website. So I can write here main website. And then on the address I would put in the website victorsfarm.com. And here it does not matter www or not. So the reason I'm calling this main website is because then after I add this, I can go back and then on the same account, I add YouTube page and add the YouTube address. So that's what you need to decide here. What's the folder name and what are the different properties, the different websites that you're tracking? And that's evident here for these different clients. Select an industry that your website falls into. If it doesn't quite fall into any of these, at the very bottom you have other. Check your time zone. And then there's a bunch of check marks here. I would recommend you turn them all off. This is, would you like to share the data of this account with these other services? Would you like to share your Google Analytics with your other Google products? It doesn't hurt you to turn them off there. Would you like to share the data of your analytics anonymously with the rest of Google Analytics users to compare your website to someone else's? Doesn't hurt you to turn it off either. Would you like to share the data of analytics with tech support? You can contact tech support and they're actually pretty good to, to, to work with. Uh, they're also available 24 hours. I've dealt with Google tech support recently. Um, I was with a client, we were at his shop, we called him at 11 p.m., they answered, we got the problem fixed in like 15 minutes. So we do answer. What I'm saying is they didn't really need some of this data, so if they needed to access the data, they can activate it at that moment. But here I'm not giving away the data without thinking. An account specialist, this is someone, this is a marketing specialist of Google, this is someone that might contact you and say, you're doing really good on Google, but if you engage in this and that and pay for this and that, you might get better results. No, I don't want to share that, I don't need a marketer, I'm doing it myself. So you can turn these on or off, doesn't matter. Then you want to get tracking ID. There's this terms of service that you have to adhere to, no one really reads it, but you should adhere to it if you want to use it. If you don't agree to these terms, you can't use it. But basically it's saying you're not going to hack the system, you're not going to steal passwords, you own, your, you own your content here, you're not doing it maliciously, basic stuff.
well, not really basic, but you know, everyone agrees to this, so accept. Then it takes you to the screen here with the code that you need to add to your website. And this one is different than the others. This one you have to add this code to your website. It's not like a download like the other thing in Google, Webmaster. This one has to be added via code to your website. Again, we'll break to help people individually. But this one's also different because I have to copy this and notice what it says. To get the benefits of analytics, copy and paste this code into every web page you want to track. If you copy this only to your index file, it will only show you data of your index. It won't show data from your about page, your contact page, your sales page. So you have to copy this to all your pages. If you're using a modern tool like Wix or WordPress or Squarespace and such, it uses templates. So if you add this to your main template, it will add it to all your subpages. If you're using Dreamweaver in a more advanced way with templates, you add this to your template and it goes to all your pages. If you're not doing that, you'll have to add this manually to all your pages. WordPress has also a plugin that is very useful. Uh, I'll get to that later. So we need to do this, but before we try to do this, let me show you this because as I said, there's many confusing things about analytics. One of them is, let's say I added this code to my page, but there's no verify button. This works by adding it to the page and eventually Google will check within about 48 hours if this code is there and then it will start tracking your data. But when you leave today here and you go back home, how do I get back to this screen? Let me show you that. At the top you have home reporting customization admin. Click on home. This takes me back takes you back to where all your accounts are, all your folders. All the data will be listed under reporting. We'll look at it next time. We've got so much data, we can create custom views to show the most important data to me quickly. And then of course admin. So when you log into analytics, you'll get the home screen first, usually. Let's go over to admin. And this has three columns of more things to work with. Account, property, view. Account here is where I can create more accounts, more folders. Notice all my folders are listed here. So if I wanted to add another account, another folder, it's under create new account. If I wanted to add a new website to my account, it's under property. Under this folder, I'm adding a new website to track. The YouTube page, the eBay page, whatever. And then over here are other specific views of your data. What I'm getting at is to get back to that admin code. It's under the admin page, the property column, JS tracking info. This is JavaScript, the JS tracking info, tracking code. And there's the, there it is again. We go back here to see the other columns of admin links to get back here because you want to copy this, paste it to your site, check within 48 hours, back on the screen, and it'll say status, receiving data. There's no verify button. I, I must say, when you want to copy from that link, admin It's going to be under admin, and then under the property column, JS tracking info tracking code. And so we'll end the main lecture in just a moment. We'll have a little lab time until 9.30. Hopefully we can set this up on your site. When we come back, then we'll start to look at the various data that we get from analytics and the other ones, because then further more on the syllabus, next week when we're, what we're going to talk about is backlinks. Backlinks are very important. Those are links from other people's website to my website. Bing and Google will tell us all the websites that are linking to my website and why that matters. That's next time. We'll talk about content creation recommendations and then applying long tail keywords to your website. 
on day one, we developed those keywords, and then now we've got these tools that will help us find more keywords. How do we use them? That'll be next time. So we're going to end the main lecture, have lab time till 30 minutes, and then we'll wrap it up. Any general questions at this point? Well, I'll help you individually, definitely, because people, again, it's different for different people. So at the moment here, then, uh, we'll wrap up the main lecture. Remember, I'm recording all of this. Send me an email for the videos, and I'll send them off to you in a timely manner, hopefully, but I get a lot of emails. And that's it for the moment.